We've come to the end of our Sunday morning study of the book of Acts. Exactly one year ago today, November 16th, 2014, I started this series of lessons. I've preached with this one 45 sermons from Acts. So that means you had a few Sundays this last year where I wasn't doing the book of Acts, but we now come to the conclusion of this, this series. And I want to just say a little bit right now about the city of Rome in the first century. It, it acted like a magnet to people from all over the empire. As the capital city, it presided majestically over the world around the Mediterranean Ocean and much of what we now call Europe. It had managed somehow to integrate Romans and Greeks and those people they called barbarians into its social life. Rome protected the culture and the language of the Greeks. It stressed respect for the rule of law. Rome had a very good reputation for efficient administration and communication. It had created an impressive system of roads and seaports. It policed all of that with a highly trained army and navy. Very little wonder to me that people far and wide wanted to visit that great city. And the Apostle Paul was no different. He wanted to see Rome. He recognized the moral decadence of that city. All you have to do is turn a page to Romans chapter 1 and read about what he says concerning Rome and, of course, the world in general. But he recognized the decadence, the evil of that city. But I think that was all the more reason that he wanted to go there with the gospel. As an ambassador for Christ, Paul realized that if Rome could be evangelized, if Rome could be won for Jesus, it would become a center from which the gospel could then be taken to the entire world. Today, our final part of the book of Acts brings us to the moment when Paul entered that great and that wicked city. Our text is Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 11, reading through verse 31. 20 up here, then another section takes us to verse 31. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods as its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. From there, we sailed across to Regium. A day later, a south wind began blowing, so the following day, we sailed up the coast to Puteoli. There we found some believers who invited us to stay with them seven days, and so we came to Rome. The believers in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came out to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God, and he took courage. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me, for they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I ask you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could tell you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, well, we've heard nothing against you. We've had no letters from Judea or reports from anyone who's arrived here, but we want to hear what you believe. For the only thing we know about these Christians is that they are denounced everywhere. So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's house. He told them about the kingdom of God and taught them about Jesus from the scriptures, from the five books of Moses and the books of the prophets. 
He began lecturing in the morning and went on into the evening. Some believed and some did not. But after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to our ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go and say to my people, you will hear my words, but you will not understand. You will see what I do, but you will not perceive its meaning. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they've closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see, their ears cannot hear, their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to realize that this salvation from God is also available to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in his own rented house. He welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God with all boldness and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. Over this past year, you have heard the entire book of Acts read out loud in your hearing, if you've been here every Sunday. Praise God for the word that he's given us. Now, this, this group of shipwrecked people that we talked about last week spent the winter months on the island of Malta. From, that would be mid-November to about mid-February. Then when the weather changed, when it became safe to sail, Paul and the others boarded another vessel from Alexandria in North Africa. Luke mentions that this ship carried the figureheads of Castor and Pollux. Those are the twin gods from the astrological sign of Gemini. They were the patron gods of sailors. They were the patron gods of the travelers and supposedly provided help and protection in storms. And you have to wonder, why does Luke mention them? Why does he mention that at all? Not because he thinks those twin gods have any power at all. He's not saying that. But he may be saying that he and Paul and Aristarchus and, and Julius, the Roman officer, all knew that it was God who had delivered them through the storm. And uh, it would be God, not Castor and Pollux, who would get them safely to Rome. Their hope was in Jesus Christ, not in the stars, not in astrological signs. And I don't really need to say this, but I guess I will. Folks, we don't need to put our hope in anything like that. We don't need to be reading horoscopes. We don't need to think that somehow the sign I was born under has anything to do with who we are and what our life is going to be like. Those things are to be rejected. And I think that may be what Luke is saying. And I also, also think he may have mentioned them to show that God always accomplishes his will and he even can use false gods to do it. The ship bearing these pagan symbols is taking Paul to Rome where he can bear witness to the truth of the gospel. That, that's ironic to me, almost humorous to me. All things, including pagan deities, are subject to God's authority. And that may be also what he's saying. Now, Luke then briefly traces the final part of the journey. From the island of Malta, they sailed to Syracuse, which is on the island of Sicily. And then they sailed across to Regium on the mainland of Italy, to Puteoli, the Forum, the Three Taverns, and then Rome. And I want you to think about this. Two and a half years of difficulty after God's assurance that Paul would go to Rome. Remember back in chapter 23? Paul, you've borne witness for me here in Jerusalem, and you'll do the same thing in Rome. Two and a half years later, he gets to the city. It had not been quick. It had not been easy. Two years in prison at Caesarea. Then a terrifying sea voyage. Then shipwreck. And then about three months on the island of Malta, and then finally, finally, he gets to Rome. And I'll tell you, that's often the way of God. Fulfilling his purpose in our lives can be costly. 
It can be difficult, it can be dangerous and time consuming. And that's a lesson that a lot of us, myself included, need to learn. Because a lot of us think that life is all about comfort and convenience and pleasure and entertainment, and it's not. Sometimes when God fulfills his will in us, he takes us through some really difficult times, like he did Paul. And we just need to be ready for that. It's not always smooth sailing. As I said a couple of weeks ago, many times the wind is against us as we're on our way to Rome, as we're on our way to fulfill his will. So just be ready for that. And don't think that it's unexpected. Don't let it surprise you when things are difficult. Now in Rome, Paul was allowed to live in his own rented house, but it seems like he's chained because he says, mentions the chain there in verse 20. But uh, he seems to be chained by the wrist, perhaps, to a Roman soldier. That guard would have been changed about every four hours. And as a result, I think, Paul and the gospel became a talking point among the palace guard. Listen to what he told the Philippian church. And remember, he's writing the Philippian letter from prison. And he says, for everyone here, talking about Rome, talking about where he was, everyone here, including all the soldiers in the palace guard, knows that I am in chains for Christ. Philippians 1, 13. So even chained, even having to be, you know, confined to that place, he is talking about the gospel and it is spreading. Now, after arriving in Rome, Paul invites all the Jewish leaders of the city to meet with him. And that, that may be surprising, especially after all that he suffered at the hands of his fellow Jews. I mean, they've been his enemies, not the Roman government up to this point. It has been his own Jewish brethren who have been his enemies. And it may be surprising to you that he says, hey, I want them all to come. But, but he loved his people. And more than anything in the world, he wanted them to believe in Jesus. He writes again in the Roman letter, chapter 10, verse 1, that the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is that the Jewish people might be saved. And that's what it's all about. He loves these people. Yes, they've hurt him. They've, they've been enemies. They've opposed him all the way. But he loves them so much, he's willing to continue to share the gospel with them. Well, when these folks arrived, they actually asked to hear more about Paul's teaching. So he's presented with this wonderful opportunity to talk to them. And did you notice verse 23 about the kingdom of God and about Jesus from all the scriptures? And then please take note of verse 31. Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. I think there's a real valuable lesson to be learned from these two verses. I mean, shouldn't that be our message? The kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to preach the kingdom? And I'm not just talking about preachers who stand in the pulpit or teachers in the classroom. All of us do teaching. All of us proclaim the good news in one way or another. What does it mean to talk about the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom, simply put, is God's rule, God's reign through Jesus Christ. The kingdom is not the church. It is not an organization. It is not an institution. It is God ruling and reigning over all things. And I believe that teaching and preaching about the kingdom is something that has been sadly neglected in many churches in, in recent times. We preach a lot about the church, haven't we? I mean, a lot of us grew up, we heard lots about the church, how the church was to worship and how it was to be organized and how we did the Lord's Supper and how we had a lot about the church, but not much about the kingdom. And they're not the same thing. Yes, there's overlap. But they're not the same thing. And we haven't talked much about the kingdom. Preaching the kingdom of God presents the larger purpose of God. And not just what he does in our individual lives. Kingdom preaching affirms that God is working out his purposes through the events of history. And that his, his purpose will be accomplished. And ultimately his kingdom will rule over all things. 
And in a world that is right at this moment racked by fear. I mean, what must it be like to live in Paris right now? We, we're in this world that's just racked by fear. Fear of demons. Fear of our enemies. Fear of economic reversals. Fear of failure. The message of the kingdom is liberating news. That God's rule is and will be established over all things. And that is our hope. And that, that is what keeps us going. And in much of today's teaching, um, we tend to focus on how Jesus meets our personal needs. And, and that's certainly true. Not denying that at all. But I'll tell you this. Sooner or later, every Christian is going to find out that God doesn't always meet some of the needs that we think are really urgent. Have you learned that yet? He doesn't always meet every need that we bring up before him. And that can cause discouragement. That can bring disillusionment. And, and sometimes people begin to look elsewhere for help. Well, Jesus is supposed to meet every one of my needs. And he hasn't done this. So I'm going somewhere else. But if the grand picture of the kingdom of God is rooted firmly in our hearts and our minds, we will never... Forsake the Lord of the universe for something or someone lesser than him. The kingdom is the message. And of course, our teaching then focuses on Jesus, the one who brings the kingdom into existence. And especially we need to talk about how he is the one through whom God is working out his eternal plan. Now, Luke seems to imply in our text that while some of the Jews believe this message... The majority did not. And the apostle quotes a very familiar text to them. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 9 through 10. This is used several other places in the New Testament. And, and, and this, this text serves as a warning to anyone who resists and rejects the gospel of Jesus. The Isaiah passage seems to imply... That when people reject him, God then gives them a spirit of stupor, a, a spirit of hardness of heart. And that those who refuse to believe, soon it becomes impossible for them to believe. Now, I don't know how all that works. I, I, don't, I do not pretend to be able to explain the sovereignty of God and the free will of mankind. I, I, I don't know how that works out. But I know that this passage and the, the places it's used elsewhere warn us. And, and we must take seriously the dangers associated with rejection and disbelief. And when people get to a certain point, it's just like they can't come back. And I think we need to be warned about that as we think about our relationship. Do you, do you really believe the gospel? Or are you saying, oh, I don't know about this. I, you know, that's a dangerous place to go because of what may happen in your heart. Now, something else that I, I see in this text is contained in that last verse. I read part of it a moment ago, verse 31. Paul welcomed during those two years that he's there in that rented house, chained to a Roman guard. But during those two years, he welcomed everybody who came to see him, proclaiming the kingdom of God with all boldness and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. And if you're reading some of the other versions, he did this unhindered, it says. He did it unhindered. And what I see here, it's a marvelous thing. It's a revelation of that which is seen and that which is unseen. What is seen? Paul's a prisoner. What we don't see is that his ministry is thriving while he's a prisoner. He's chained to a guard. That's what you see. But in reality, he's free. He's silenced, but not really. His voice goes out, you know, through all kinds of other people. He was unhindered. Isn't that great? He's having to live in that house chained to a prisoner, uh, chained to a guard as a prisoner, but he's unhindered. This is the only place in the New Testament where that word is used. And I think it speaks of, of his condition, but I think it also speaks to the state of the church then and now and always. The world tries to hinder us in all kinds of ways, but we are free to proclaim the good news of Jesus. 
Folks, walls and bars and chains and prison doors mean nothing to God and to his word. Paul speaks to that paradox in his final letter as he wrote to Timothy and said, And because I preach this good news, I am suffering and I've been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. Isn't that great? There's that paradox. There's that, that which is seen. Paul's a prisoner. He's chained. But the word he preaches, it cannot be contained. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. And I take, I take encouragement from that. Because we are being hindered. I mean, try, the world tries to hinder us. It always has. Satan has always thrown up all kinds of roadblocks in the way of the gospel. But it cannot be hindered. Now, one final matter to consider. As this great book closes, it's so incomplete. I mean, what happened to Paul? Did he have his day in court? Was he acquitted? Was he condemned? Why doesn't Luke finish the story? I mean, none of us, none of us want to read a book. None of us want to go see a movie that just leaves us hanging. We don't know what happened. I, I hate that kind of thing. There are a few movies like that. Of course, they're getting ready for the sequel. You know, they're going to do whatever. But, but none of us really like that. Why does Luke just leave us hanging? Well, there are several possible answers to that question. It may be as simple as this. Luke got to this point in the story, and for some reason he couldn't go on. Maybe he died. Perhaps he was prevented in some other way from continuing the story. And that's all it is. He just got to that point. He intended to go on, but he couldn't. And there it ends. That's a possibility. I don't think that's what happened, but that's a possibility. Or perhaps he did finish what he set out to accomplish, which is the story of the triumphant march of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. From that tiny group of frightened disciples in Judea to the victorious entry of the gospel into the capital city of the empire. William Barclay believed that was the answer to the question. Let me read you something that he said. He says, the tale is finished. The story that began in Jerusalem rather more than 30 years ago has finished in Rome. It's nothing less than a miracle of God. The church, which at the beginning of Acts could be numbered in scores, cannot now be numbered in tens of thousands. The story of the crucified man of Nazareth has swept across the world in its conquering course until now, without let or hindrance, it's being preached in Rome, the capital of the world. The gospel has reached the center of the world and is being freely proclaimed. And Luke's task is at an end. That's another possibility. That Luke did what he set out to do. And that's the story. I think there's a third possibility. I like that one. But I think there's a third possibility. And that is simply this. The story of the church is never over. It will not be over until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. The acts of the Holy Spirit that we've been reading about for all of this year. It goes on in churches. It goes on in classrooms. It goes on in the marketplace. It goes on in homes and in prisons. Nothing can stop it. And we are still part of the story. We are the latest chapter in the book of Acts. I don't know how many more chapters there are going to be, but we are the latest chapter in the book of Acts. And I hope that that understanding will give us renewed vision, renewed energy to go out and to do what these disciples did. And that is to tell everybody the good news of what Jesus has done and the message of the kingdom, the rule of God. Because we're still part of this story. It hasn't ended, folks. It's not over. We're still carrying it on. And I hope we can go forth with this whole book in our hearts and in our minds with that great message. It's what it's all about. The Holy Spirit taking the gospel to the world. Let's pray together. Father, I, I thank you for this last year. And we're grateful for every single word in the scripture. But right now, I'm especially grateful for the book of Acts. And for what we've learned and how we've been encouraged and how we've been emboldened. And how we've been just kind of pumped up to do what those disciples did. Give us that heart, Father. Give us that spirit. 
that will go out, proclaim the message to the whole world. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen.